welcome. Uh, John and I officially, I suppose, uh, I include him. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you all again to Kilcoolies, to Valley Bunyan and to the fifth, would you believe it or not, Women in the Media weekend. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we truly hope that you enjoy what we have on offer for the weekend. The weekend will be officially open first by a wonderful lady uh, who since prior to its inception has been a stalwart supporter of women in the media. Starting her career in politics at a very early age, she was the youngest ever member of the Shannon when appointed at the tender age of 24. She was then elected to Dáil Éireann in 1981 and retained her seat at every election until her retirement in 2011. She was the founder member of the Progressive Democrats along with Desi O'Malley and Bobby Malloy and succeeded Desi O'Malley as the leader in 1993. She was appointed the first female Tánaiste in 1997. With numerous portfolios, ministerial positions and su excuse me, successful election campaigns to her credit, she ensured she has carved her own niche in political life in Ireland. But on a personal level, this lady has offered me a never-ending stream of support, guidance and most of all encouragement. <clears throat> Encouragement to keep going, most especially when the going gets tough. She has tirelessly, tirelessly supported women in media, both through her personal involvement in the weekend and her promotion of the event. She encapsulates all that we celebrate over the coming days by being a strong, unwavering force, particularly in male-dominated areas, and one who celebrates other women and facilitates their professional achievements. Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome please Miss Mary Harney. Thank you very much, Joan, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when Joan um, invited me this year to open the conference, and I said, okay, I'm happy to come, but I don't need to always speak. Sometimes it's more important to listen. That's, only, that's when you learn things. Um, and then when I got the program a few weeks ago, I was away, and I saw it was at 4.30. I said, I got on to Joan, I said, are you mad? There will be nobody in the room at 4.30. And if I'd known this sunshine was going to uh, be here, I certainly wouldn't have agreed. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can I say how happy I am to see my former colleagues, uh, Jimmy Deanahan, who's a great pal of mine. Um, when I hear he's doing the sport thing on Sunday morning, I might even decide to do that myself. <laughs> um, also to see Anya Collins and Fidel Mahili uh, from Galway, uh, three former parliamentary colleagues of mine. And it's fantastic to see them here. The reason I'm here is because of the dynamo that is Joan O'Connor. She's a fantastic person. And, uh, they say leadership is open to all of us, but belongs to those that take it. And certainly Joan uh, takes leadership on board. Uh, I came to this hotel about five or six years ago. One Sunday afternoon, we were taking Brian's brother, who wasn't well, out for a drive from Limerick. And we arrived in Ballybunion and I saw uh, Cooley Country House and I said, that looks like a nice place to have lunch. So we go in and uh, this wonderful woman appeared, Joan, and she was so welcoming and so friendly, so friendly that she didn't even give me a bill. Uh, I know it was the recession, but we could have afforded the lovely lunch. And she said, I have this idea about women in the media, what do you think? And we got chatting and I didn't think much more about it. Next thing, it was all happening. And uh, she put a lot of thought into it, and I think it's terrific. And it's been a great success because it gives people an opportunity to come away from Dublin and to reflect for a while. And I want to talk about how important it is to reflect, as I feel very strongly about it. Um, the, the decision I made when I left politics was not to comment on political issues um, and also not to be a frequent visitor to Leinster House. When I was a very young politician, I used to see former retired members in every day having their lunch. And I asked a friend of mine, the late Pat O'Malley actually, I said to her, why do you think they come in every day to have their lunch? It sounds so boring. And she said, the wives just want to get them out from under their feet. <laughs> and uh, I always said I'll never be that person in there every day having my lunch and hanging out where I used to work. And neither would I comment on political issues because I think the people that are elected are more than capable of making the decisions for themselves. But the only exception is a weekend like this, because if you're invited to open a conference, um, there's nothing worse than talking and saying nothing, if you understand what I mean. 
When I was appointed a junior minister in 1989, a, a, a fellow junior minister said to me, now the way you get on in this department is you keep your head down and you say nothing. <laughs> and uh, he got away with that for quite a long time actually. I think he only spoke in the doll a handful of times over his 25 years there. But, um, so there are a few things I'd like to just reflect on and comment on. Because when you stand back, stand back from the political scene, um, it is good to observe what's going on in a, perhaps an objective fashion. And the first thing, and it's connected with the media, and it's the issue of good governance. And there's nowhere that good governance is more important than in the cabinet room. And I have unfortunately seen lately a tendency for sensitive documents to be leaked. I refer in particular to an article in the Irish Times of the 4th of April, when two very fine journalists had either seen or had access to the memo that was going to the government that day on the broadband contract. It was extremely sensitive. Um, that information could, could lead in the public domain at that point, because the Minister Nocturne was bringing the memorandum to inform the government of uh, possible legal challenges. And yet, before the government got a chance to consider that memo, it was in the front of the Irish, it was in the Irish Times. I consider anyone that, clearly it wasn't the line minister that did that or anyone associated with them, but whoever did that and had access to that, I think uh, was involved in a gross act of sab possible sabotage of the state. And I don't like to use those words, but I think if you're a member of a government and you can't have the memorandum in advance to consider what you're being asked to decide, then we won't get good decision making. Um, you can't make government decisions up on the hoof. You have to be able to consider them, read the data, consult, maybe take advice from your officials and those that advise you. And if, as we've read recently, memorandums are being brought under the arms of ministers because of the sensitivity of the issues that are going to be discussed, and every minister, particularly every political group within the cabinet, has an opportunity to consider that, we are going to have bad decision making at the very highest level in our country. And I regret that very much. And I believe anybody in government, there's about 19 people that sit around that table uh, who are worthy of being there, should also be worthy of the professionalism that goes with one of the most important jobs of all. And the second issue I want to refer to is, uh, it was in the Examiner and other newspapers where the Attorney General was quoted and the Secretary to the government. And the Attorney General was quoted as having advised the government that if even one minister uh, did not express confidence in the Garda Commissioner, uh, then they, they, were being, they could be exposed uh, to a serious case against the state. And the Attorney General's advice was quoted. I'd never seen that before. And so was the Secretary to the Government. And I make the comments not to be critical of anybody, but rather to say uh, that these are serious issues that have to be dealt with seriously. Um, journalists love leaks, of course. We probably all love leaks. Uh, and we've seen many of them in, in recent times. And the issue I refer to is not exclusive to this government, I hasten to add. It's happened before and it's happened in governments of which I was a member. Uh, but it's not good enough, quite honestly. Um, and we need to take it seriously. And we meet, need to be mindful of the implications that can follow from some sensitive information being put into the public domain in that fashion. But the, the issue of the media... Um, Charles Jar Darwin once said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, or the most intelligent, but those that are capable of adapting. And nowhere is that more true than the area of the media. Um, I had an opportunity recently of speaking to about 30, 30 year olds, or roughly 30 year olds, uh, in an organisation that asked me to come and talk about my career. Um, I felt quite elderly, quite honestly, because some of the names I mentioned, I could see from the reaction, they'd never heard of them. <laughs> so, uh, but one thing I did learn from that, as I do from my own friends, children, my nieces and nephews, is that young people nowadays don't tend to read newspapers, and they form their opinions based on headlines. Obviously, the media has become, uh, it's a digital-centric world we live in, and consumers now have huge powers, and that's no bad thing. Social media has a very important role to play and we have to learn to live with it and to use it and to learn from it. But what I do worry about is the fact that opinions are being formed based on headlines with no analysis, no reflection, no context, no perspective. And that is a very bad thing. And whether it's an ordinary individual or the president of a country, 
that uses Twitter and other forms of social media to get messages across. We have to complement and supplement that with proper analysis. And I know tomorrow there's a session on truth in the media, and I recently had the pleasure of listening to Olivia O'Leary speak at an event in Dublin um, on this issue. And she made a very, what I thought, significant point. If we want to get good quality journalism, we're going to have to pay for it. It does not come cheap. Uh, and I'm concerned that there will be, as there is in politics now, a cynicism around serious journalism and serious analysis, and people won't be prepared to support it. And young people in particular will form opinions about very important issues um, that will influence our society for the future based on flimsy headlines. We all saw the, uh, what's become known as Lexit recently. At one level, it was the trivialization of an important subject. At another level, it was sexism in certain parts of the media, devaluing and debasing uh, important issues. Um, sexism can be ripe in certain places, and maybe those that don't put much effort into sourcing their stories and establishing the credibility, and sometimes uh, establishing the motive of those that may be putting a slant on a story they're imparting. Good journalists do that. We've been fortunate in Ireland to have many good journalists. We still have fantastic journalists. But I worry about the environment in which they have to operate in and the manner in which that type of journalism will be supported financially because it cannot happen without appropriate financial uh, supports. Another issue that um, I'm concerned about is the, the number of illegal immigrants in Ireland whose status has not been normalised or regulated. We go every year to the United States and we plead for the undocumented Irish to be recognised and, uh, and legalised. And we do that and it's the right thing to do and Minister Deanahan did it on many occasions as Minister for the Diaspora. I did it myself. But surely the time has come for us to do that to the immigrants that are here. There's about 26,000 of them. I personally know of somebody who's here 15 years. He has a young child, six years old. His mother is a legal citizen, she's here 34 years. His sister is, has Irish residency. And do you think we can get the Department of Justice to recognise that person? No, why? He worked in the black economy. Well, that's what the Irish have been doing in America for many years. And I really would appeal to the government. Um, and I'm not saying we have an open door, and that everyone that comes here uh, can be made legal. Obviously, people would have to pass a character test in terms of not having committed any criminal offences, be prepared to work. Grant people a work permit. Let them be legally here. It makes, from a humanitarian point of view, it's the right thing. It makes economic sense and it's pragmatic. Why should we tie up the, the Gardaí in um, trying to pursue these people uh, who are only citizens trying to make a living? The Irish survived here for many years uh, at home because people that went abroad were able to support them. And this person I'm talking about is trying to do that for his family his wider extended family because he only has one sibling who's legally here uh, in the Philippines. He's passed his driving test, can't get a license, can't leave the country, can't go back to see his grandmother. Um, and, and I just instance him because I know him well. Um, many of these people work as carers, looking after our elderly and dependent citizens. Um, they're exploited because they can't be legal um, from some unscrupulous um, employers. Last night, as I was reflecting on what I was going to talk about today, there was a repeat of a programme I saw many years ago um, about the sweepstakes. And I'm old enough to remember the sweepstakes. Many of you probably aren't. But that was a great scam. It enriched certain people. Apparently, $10 million uh, worth of tickets were sent to, the, to Canada, which was illegal, uh, under the guise of being food products. And RT made a programme. Charlie Bird was interviewed last night with Michael Heaney. Now, the interviews went way back. It was just a, a repeat of a programme. And they made a programme about these 10 million tickets being sold in America, in Canada. And the tickets weren't even put in the draw. Complete scam, enriching certain people. And the RT authorities decided it couldn't be shown. It was unpatriotic. I'm delighted we've passed that test of what patriotism is, because sometimes some individuals with influence confuse the national interest with their own self-interest. Um, I remember as Minister for Industry we brought in an ex gracia payment for those employees at the sweepstakes because they were quite honestly abandoned by their employer, many of them elderly women. 
um, and there was a, a next grass here payment brought in by the government uh, in 2000 um, and supported by all parties in the Dáil. Um, but that was the era that operated for journalists because we were a very small, closed society. We've moved on from that uh, and that is a very good thing uh, that we're prepared to inquire into wrongdoings of the past and hold those to account, particularly those that exploit uh, the most vulnerable in our society. Lastly, can I say in relation to women, it's my experience that very often women see the other woman as their competitor and ignore the men. Um, I've always worked on the basis that women and men work best together and decisions are better when women and men are making the decisions. Um, I don't belong to the school of thought that men are bad and we shouldn't be involved with them. And in fact, the more men we have involved in this weekend, the better. It's about women and men complementing each other and working together. We have different perspectives, we have different experiences, um, and the dynamic decision-making you get from that different perspective and experiences and maybe backgrounds leads to better decisions. Madeleine, Madeleine Albright once said, there's a special place in hell for women that don't support other women. I'm delighted to say that we have now 35 women in the Dáil. When I went into Leinster House first in 1977 as a senator, Virtually all of the women there um, were inheritors of seats. Either their late, their late husbands had died and they had been elected, and the widow was always the popular candidate in, in the 70s and 80s, or they were daughters of former male holders of the office. They were there by virtue of inheritance rather than in their own right. That has changed utterly, and that is a very good thing. But the worry is that there's a lot of cynicism about politics. In my experience, the vast majority of people that I've worked with that served in politics are there for honourable and decent motives. They're interested in public policy and serving their community. And yet, politics has been dumbed down constantly, sometimes helped by a few politicians who get everybody a bad name. But we need to inspire and encourage people uh, into politics. It's so important. The decisions that affect all our lives are made in the political arena. Uh, legislation through the doll in the cabinet room and if we have an absence of women and men particularly young educated people uh, in those positions we will not get objective decision making we will not get the best decisions for our country and for our society and I do detect uh, that young people are not as enthused and interested in political issues um, as my generation were the exception probably was the gay marriage referendum which did, did enthuse young people. It was fantastic for that reason. I didn't meet any single young person that didn't want to vote and have a view. Majority in favour, not all, but the majority were in favour. But it was great to see such a huge turnout of young people and the number of them that came back from London and elsewhere simply to vote. That was absolutely uh, tr uh, tremendous. And if we want to get more young people in, we need to be enthusiastic about politics and not be complaining about it. Infectious enthusiasm wins people over. So ladies and gentlemen, in opening this Women in the Media uh, on this the fifth occasion, it's a great privilege and pleasure for me uh, to be here because uh, this wouldn't happen without the wonderful work of Joan. And I want to acknowledge Mary Dundon, who's not with us, who's organised it with Joan in previous years. She's taken a year out in Siena uh, to, to do a course. I met her actually, bumped into her a couple of months ago and she's really enjoying it there. And um, so we want to acknowledge that she was instrumental in helping Joan and Campy with us. But lastly, can I say, if there's any message, we're starting a session now uh, on women coming back into the workforce. Um, and I think it'll be a very interesting and inspiring session. When I left, Poly I went into Leinster House straight from college. And when I left there in January 2011, I hadn't really thought about what I'd do next. And the first few months were very difficult because you go from, not quite 24-7, but politics is all consuming. And suddenly you wake up and I had six Saturdays and one Sunday every week. And uh, that doesn't really <laughs> suit me. But um, I did discover that the skills that you apply to a political career are transferable. It's just a question of confidence in being able to use that skill set, whether it's analysing a lot of data and being able to understand it and apply it. Uh, but at the end of the day, whether you work in, as a company director or you work as a consultant to a company, it is about common sense. 
And as somebody said, the one thing about common sense is it's not that common sometimes, uh, and that's true. So I think those of you that may have opted out of the workforce to look after your family, I met a lady uh, earlier who said she's a retired teacher. I said after the next session, um, you'll be going back to a new career. Uh, because I think the women that we're going to hear are a fantastic example of the possibilities and opportunities that lie in the world we live in today. We live in a world that is full of opportunity uh, and possibility, and I think that's fantastic. And instead of seeing the challenges uh, and the complexities and the constraints, it is great to see the opportunities that exist. So ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Um, Joan has encouraged you to walk the beaches. She'll also be encouraging you to go to the jazz and to come to all the sessions, and you'll go home on Sunday exhausted, but you'll have been inspired, and you'll have learned a lot, and you'll have met new friends, and it's great to see the familiar faces um, back here again from last year, uh, and some new people too, and I can say to those of you that are here for the first time, you'll have one hell of a weekend, fantastic fun, and the wonderful hospitality of John and Joan O'Connor in the beautiful uh, Kilcooley house, and can I thank, I don't know if she's in the room yet, I saw her arriving earlier, Olivia O'Leary uh, gave it a plug last night on TV3. I was switching from one channel to the other at around 7.30, uh, finding something to see. Uh, so that was fantastic. And uh, Olivia, I know, is mediating or chairing tomorrow's session. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure uh, to open the fifth um, Women in the Media Conference and to wish it every success.